In today's episode, we are going over a case study of an individual that underwent hip labral repair. We're going to be talking about their rehab from week zero all the way up to month three. Let's get going. First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, a coach, a personal trainer, and I am a meathead. I love all things fitness and weight training. This is a fitness pain-free show where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving a positive review. Helps me out tremendously. And if you want to go that next step to really support the channel, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain for Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. I think Netflix, but for coaches and physical therapists. It's got premium uh, content that's been updated every month for years, about five so far. Uh, it's all been updated by me. You've got over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides a private Facebook group where you can ask any questions and you can also decide upcoming podcast topics. You can get started for just $1. After that, it's $12.99 per month. Like I said, it's the best way to support me and it's an absolute no brainer if you want to try to continue your education. Uh, so go ahead and click on fitnesspainfree.com, go on the programs tab, and then click on fitness pain free insiders online library. I'll also leave a link in the show notes if you want to click on it from there. So what is treatment looking like at week six to 10? So week six for this individual is the first week they're actually allowed to do any sort of weight bearing. Okay. Like I said, this is a little bit delayed because of that. I think this patient actually progressed through the weight bearing process more quickly than most folks do. Right. But he wait, he waited until six weeks to do this. And the other part is that you could argue that he lost a bit of muscle mass in the, in the process, because if he was able to weight bear at week three or four, then that would have attenuated some of that muscle loss that we get from not being able to move. Right. So typically speaking, I give athletes about two to three days to wean off the crutches. And this really depends on how irritable their hip is. Okay. So we go over some walking drills, which we'll talk about in a second. And we give those as a home exercise program. I basically have the patient work on these walking drills two or three times a day, five, 10 minutes or so. And over the course of time, as they're getting better at walking and walking is not so big a deal, we ditch the crutches, excuse me, crutches, and we slowly ramp up the amount of walking over the course of time. Okay. Uh, this patient actually had a very seamless transition. The process of going from non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing to weight bearing was very, very smooth. Uh, for some folks, it takes a little bit longer. So just listen to the person and just push them as fast as their body is able to handle. Don't force anything. Okay. In terms of gait training, uh, that is a topic for another day. Uh, but some of the things I like to look at and then train for ambulation are first and foremost posture. So for a lot of these folks, you'll notice they're kind of stooped over. When they take a step, they will stoop forward as the surgical leg goes behind them. So as that surgical leg is trying to extend and doesn't want to extend, the torso will have a compensation of flexing, right? So you'll notice they kind of come forward when that surgical leg is coming behind them. So I just make them aware of that. Just make sure that they're pointing their pelvis straight ahead and they're staying nice and tall as they walk. Their stamp length is also often um, limited on one side. So think about stepping with my contralateral limb. When I step with my contralateral limb, it's going to stretch the front of the hip, right? So it makes sense. I'm not going to step very far with the contralateral side. I'm going to take a short step with my contralateral side and a long stride with my surgical leg, right? So we make the patient aware of that. And we try to have an even step length. The other piece you'll see is a, an altered speed of stepping, right? So think about a metronome where it goes click, 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 click click. It's nice and even. That's how our stepping normally is, right? So for these patients, I'll often bring out a metronome. I'll set it, let's say around hundred steps per minute, I'll have them walk and try to keep the beat of the metronome. Okay. And lastly, these folks tend to walk like a robot. Their arms stay super duper stiff. So we want them to relax their arms, relax their upper body, let things normally swing the way they should. Okay. And the last piece is that we have to slowly ramp up steps and the way I try to make this a bit more objective is by telling my patients to use a pedometer. Most folks will have one of these in their phone, so they can just use an app on their phone to measure their steps, or they may have a pedometer themselves. And the idea is you start with less steps and you go more of the course of time. I think it's particularly helpful for folks when they have to say, let's go grocery shopping or do some sort of task that requires a decent amount of walking, but they never realize how many steps it takes to go around Costco. Now they have a pedometer, which kind of gives them immediate feedback. It says, okay, this is a lot of steps. I need to back off a bit 
And if they are particularly sore, they can see if they took many, too many steps the days or weeks prior, right? How about range of motion at week six to 10? So again, it is as needed. And what I mean by that is that at the start of every session, I will range that person's hip. So I'll go into hip abduction, flexion, internal rotation, external rotation, and we'll also check extension. And we just treat what's limited, okay? So let's say you're still limited in hip extension. We'll work on some anterior hip soft tissue work, then we'll do some passive range of motion. And after that, we'll follow them up with some active mobility drills for the patient. Usually it's more dynamic in nature just because static stretching tends to be a little more provocative. So nice, easy, active range of motion. Nothing crazy at this point. Also keep in mind that the, the range that is usually going to be most limited is going to be flexion and internal rotation. And again, I just don't push that too much because I find it very provocative and it tends to get better over the course of time. What does strength look like at week six to 10? So strengthening is usually three days per week. And then on off days, we usually do some sort of conditioning or basic easy stuff, right? We'll talk about that, excuse me, talk about that in a bit. Um, but we're starting to introduce bilateral strengthening at week six, okay? So first and foremost, I want this person to be able to walk well. I'm introducing lifting at the same time, but I'm not having the intent of loading that person up. We're just trying to introduce the movements and have them look pretty good. Now, this is where this patient really shined because they have been doing squatting, deadlifting for years now, and they're very, very good and they're very strong individuals. So getting back to that is not that tough. Uh, for someone who's never squatted before in their life, this is sometimes a very challenging process. All right. But for this patient, it wasn't. Okay. So initially when we squat, when we deadlift, we start with a partial range of motion and it's usually unloaded. If it's well tolerated and technique looks good, I start to add a little bit of load. We're also watching for compensation. What you'll often see, especially in the squat, is that individuals will shift away from the painful side. Oftentimes, they'll rotate some to get their leg in some horizontal abduction, okay, to increase some of the space in the front of the hip and become a little more comfortable. Uh, you also, also will see a bunch of posterior pelvic tilt and lumbar flexion towards the bottom of the squat. And this is usually just because the body is protecting you. The hip doesn't want to flex, so you get some compensation, all right? So we squat in front of a mirror. I take a lot of videos. I give a lot of feedback. Okay. I show them the videos. I give them cues. We also have access to force plates, which is phenomenal because when we squat, you can tell like, okay, you have 25% of your weight on your right, 75 on your left. Let's even that up a little bit. And it gives you a little bit of visual feedback because you can see how much weight you have on the left versus the right. And you can try to even it up by looking at a screen, right? It's giving you that feedback in real time. Uh, we use the VOD force plates and we've liked them a lot so far. Week seven, so one week after we've introduced both walking as well as bilateral strength, I'm starting to introduce single-legged strength, okay? And just keep in mind, it's the first time we've done this in a long while. The leg has gotten pretty dang weak, all right? And the movements I want to try to introduce are split squats, single-legged squats, single-legged deadlifts, and step-ups. But we have to start with very easy variations, okay? The other piece that we tend not to think about is in the split squat, the trail side leg is very important, okay? It helps us to produce some force. When we do a split squat, the leg is being held into end range hip extension, which can be pretty aggressive in terms of stretching the front of the hip. So I will say that I introduce a split squat this time, but I only start to push it if it's well tolerated. If some individuals actually take it away and substitute it out for something else just because it doesn't feel great, which I have another patient right now. He's not tolerating split squats, so we're not pushing it. Okay. This patient here did phenomenal with the split squat. So we just kind of continued pushing it and loading it and getting stronger over the course of time. Okay. Usually we start again with partial ranges of motion, just like the bilateral lifts. And we actually start with some assistance. So let's say I'm doing a step up. I'll use a TRX so the individual can use their upper body a little bit to assist their lower body. Right. And the same thing occurs. People are pretty apt to compensate. So you'll see folks trying to use a knee strategy. Right. So they'll stay very upright and they'll drive that knee forward because they don't want to load the hip. They want to load the knee instead. All right. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of what you'll see for knee pain. Okay, but think about it. When you have knee pain, you load up the hip over the knee. When you have hip pain, you load up the knee over the hip. So just be aware of that. Uh, I'll often find some of my athletes will end up with some patellofemoral symptoms, so pain on that surgical leg because they're compensating around that painful hip, right? And again, we use a mirror, we use videos, and we use a force plate for a little biofeedback to tell how much weight we're putting left versus right. We make sure we clean up that technique over the course of time. At week... Uh, At week six, we're continuing direct hip isolation strength. This is for hip flexion, 
adduction, abduction, extension, and rotation, okay, which is going to be a combination of, let's say, adduction and internal rotation and abduction and external rotation. So we're starting to work those motions a little bit more, right? The reason why I have flexion and adduction bolded is because these tend to be the weakest motions for folks prior to going to surgery, and they're definitely weak afterwards. Okay. So we really want to make sure that we push flexion and adduction and also keep in mind that flexion can be provocative. So we have to be careful still, but we do need to get this strength back. It tends to be a very forgotten muscle group. And we need to make sure we do uh, improve that over time. Okay. We're still thinking about the accessory muscles. So quads, hamstrings, calves, core, all that good stuff. And what you'll notice is we start to phase out blood flow restriction training. So now we're doing it one to two times a week, whereas in the past we're doing it twice and even more if the individual had access to that at home. Okay. So why is that? Well, I think a mistake is to think that BFR is advanced training. It's not. Advanced training is heavy loads, high speeds, sports specific skills, right? BFR is none of those things. Okay. So it's a nice adjunct at this stage to add a little extra strength and a hypertrophy to a target area. But you have to keep in mind that as you get better and you get more advanced with rehab, we have to move away from this. Okay. So you'll naturally see that occur in my program. The other piece that tends to get forgotten is going to be balance. Okay. Uh, the reason being is that after you have a labral repair, the labrum has a proprioceptive function. It tells you where your hip is in space and that's just been altered, right? First it was torn. Now it's been repaired. So there's all sorts of funky information coming from the hip and it's probably not in alignment with what the brain remembers. And we have to retrain that over the course of time. So we're definitely working on balance at this stage. How about off days? So generally with these folks, we're doing strength training two to three days a week. So on the off days, we still continue to do exercise, but it's not quite as intense, right? So we'll do some direct hip isolation work. So work all those same muscles, but at a lower level. All right. We also will do some range of motion exercises if that individual needs it. We also do our conditioning on off days. Okay. And the last piece is that I will have individuals start doing more walking and I'll put them on a progressive walking program. If they have to get back to some sort of change of direction, running sport, endurance activity. Uh, again, this individual was a baseball player, their pitcher running is not going to be as important as throwing. So we didn't push that very much. Here's a snapshot of the program from week six to week 10. As you can see, we're squatting and deadlifting on a force plate. We're doing isolation work, so Copenhagen planks, starting with a short lever. We're also working on recline hip flexion, another easy exercise to work on hip flexor strength. We're doing some balance exercise with a little bit of a neurocognitive demand. We're doing some walking over hurdles in multiple directions with basketball tossing. We're doing an assisted lateral step down. We're working on hip abduction external rotation strength with half side plank with clamshells more single-legged strengthening, single-legged squatting to a box. As you can see, I'm using a kickstand here, so an assisted single-legged squat. We're doing some side-stepping with a yellow band to work on the hip abductors. We are working the calves with single-leg calf raises. We're working the single-legged deadlift, but assisted, holding onto the rig a little bit. More balanced work by standing on Airx and having uh, the neurocognitive demand of a chest pass, right? And then lastly, you can see our BFR session is 30 reps followed by 15 reps, 15 reps, 15 reps with 30 seconds rest in between sets. Uh, we're typically trying to use around 20% of the person's max. Uh, we have no idea what that is at this point, just because they haven't lifted a maximal load in months. Who knows how strong they are, What the movements we chose were a seated hamstring curl, weighted hip thrusts. We used a sandbag for this. We did uh, knee extensions using the tib bar and also did a calf raise. Okay. Again, if you can't see this and you're listening to the audio version of this, head over to YouTube and you can actually take a snapshot of this um, and see all the movements and how I program out. So moving on to week 10 to 14, uh, we are approaching the end of my physical therapy with this athlete, right? Uh, they're actually leaving our facility around week 12 to 13. Okay. So I'm not going to be able to do the rest of their rehab, but this is what we plan and what we've done so far. Okay. So in terms of range of motion, nothing has really changed. We're just pushing what is needed. At this point, the only things that are limited in this athlete are going to be a little bit of hip flexion. The hip internal rotation is actually pretty dang good, all right? So I'm not concerned about that at all, okay? Uh, if we were still having a lot of trouble with range of motion, we can probably start being a bit more aggressive with our stretching. So maybe we're starting some more static stretching. We're throwing in some more weighted stretching or eccentrics, right? Just be cautious because even though we're a little bit further along in the rehab, you can still flare this thing up to the point where it sets you back, okay? Okay. 
In terms of strengthening, we still maintain the three times per week and we're loading more. Okay. So initially we were really concerned about getting the technique down, uh, making sure that we don't have any compensation. At this point, the technique is looking pretty good and we can start loading this up. All right. Uh, what I will say is that the amount of time it takes people to get back to good technique is very variable. Okay. I've had a lot of athletes that take maybe a month more than this individual did in order to get their technique back. Uh, for whatever reason, things went really, really smooth with this patient. And I was able to push the load. Uh, I will say that I wouldn't push the load unless it looked good. So just, you know, be aware of me loading at week 10 might not be what happens for your athlete. Okay. Don't push that load unless they're ready for it. The technique looks good and they're not having symptoms. Okay. We start loading the squat with a goblet. So a kettlebell or dumbbell held in a goblet position. And as that's tolerated well, we need to add some more load. We just shift over to front squats. Okay. We started with the kettlebell remaining deadlift and we progressed to a trap bar deadlift. Next, we want to load single legged strength. Okay. And what that means is we're using the same exercises. We're just increasing the load, increasing the range of motion. And now we're starting to work a little bit in the frontal plane. Okay. So see a little bit later, we started to introduce a lateral deadlift. So we're starting to build power outside of the sagittal plane or the forward and backwards plane. Okay. Obviously this gentleman's a pitcher. He's going to need to produce power in the sagittal plane as well as the frontal plane and the transverse plane. We have to work all of those things. And now we're starting to do that. Uh, just keep in mind a lateral deadlift, lateral squat is an increased range of motion demand on the hip, a little tougher on post-op hip labor repairs, right? Remember, abduction is going to increase stress on that surgical repair site. So we have to be careful about this and go slowly over the course of time. Just like before, we're still on the lookout for compensation. We're using mirrors, we're using video biofeedback. And I've started to move away from the force plate at this point, but we can still continue loading on there if we'd like to. Okay. The other thing that's in my mind at week 10, week 10 to 12, is preparing for plyometrics. So generally speaking, plyometrics will start around three months, okay, at a very low level. I want to prepare my athletes for eventual, eventual acceleration, deceleration, moving laterally, all that good stuff. And the way I bridge that gap is by first loading with the sled, right? So at week 10, we're doing forward and backward sled pushes and then drags. And we're keeping the loads heavy and the speed is still pretty slow. All right. However, we're still working the acceleration positions and back pedal positions just by pushing to a sled. We mimic those positions, pulling backwards. We mimic those positions. Then at week 12, we start working in the frontal plane. So I like to do a lateral sled drag and a lateral sled shuffle. At this point, we are continuing direct hip isolation strength. However, it's a good idea to assess your strength at this point. Okay. So we use a force frame from Vald. And it's just a kind of a fancy force plate dynamometer setup that allows you to kind of easily uh, test all the musculature around the hip. So we test hip adduction, hip abduction, hip extension. We take a look at knee flexion, knee extension. We take a look at the lower body in general, and we just figure out what's still limited. Now, this is phenomenal because we can work the areas that are still limited. And just like I said earlier, the motion and the uh, strength area that was limited in this individual was hip flexion. Okay. We kind of knew that going into it, uh, but hip abduction, adduction, all that stuff came back at this point for the most part is relatively symmetrical, uh, except the hip flexion was not. So we need to make sure we continue working on that over the course of time. Okay. We also try to increase the challenge of our isolation work. So obviously you can do that through more load. We can also change the exercise variation up a little bit. I'm a big fan of Copenhagen planks. We can make those more challenging just by increasing the, the length of the lever, right? I'm a big fan of side bridge variations, and we can also increase the challenge of glute medius work by going from a short lever, so kind of a half side bridge to a full side bridge, adding abduction, putting band on top, on top of that. We can get really creative with our strength and exercise at this point. And lastly, I like to continue increasing the challenge of balance exercise. At this point, we incorporated some water balls uh, called the chaos of water balls. Balance on one leg, reaching in multiple directions, adding some speed to that, increasing the balance and stability demand some. Next comes the question of conditioning. Okay, so conditioning is actually very important. And uh, Tim Gabbett has done a lot of this research. Uh, and he basically correlated VO2 max with risk of injury. Okay, and that's with rugby players, right? So I think VO2 max and conditioning, that's just a reflection of how prepared you are for a given sport. Okay, so obviously you need to be well conditioned moving to your sport. What happens if your sport doesn't need a ton of traditional conditioning? Okay. Think about the difference between a baseball pitcher, which this individual is, he's a reliever too. So he's not like he's pitching the entire time. He's, you know, pitching a little bit towards the end, right? 
demands he has on his sport can be very different than a basketball player or a soccer player. All right. The other thing to think about is that the conditioning that you do with these individuals is going to come into direct competition with the strength work you're doing. Okay. Now I know that you can work strength at the same time as conditioning. You can make progress in both. I, I get that. I'm not trying to uh, contest that idea, but what I will say is that the hip is only going to handle so much stress. Okay. And you can do more strengthening or you can do more conditioning. If you both at the same time, you can kind of blow up that hip. It gets really irritated and sets you back. All right. So for this individual, I actually push the strength a little more than I push the conditioning. And that's because they're a pitcher. They're trying to get back to pitching. They're not trying to get back to soccer. However, they will have to do some running eventually. So we have to get to it at some point. It's just that I made the decision to push the strength, right? And eventually some more of the power stuff over the, the, the excuse me, the decision to push conditioning and more running work. Okay. That being said, we still try to increase the conditioning over the course of time. And we start that off by building volume. So if someone's riding the bike first for 15 minutes. We ramp that up to 20, then 25, then 30 minutes or so after around week 10 to 12. And again, speak to your surgeon first, figure out what the protocol says and make sure it's okay. But we tend to start to make the transition over to elliptical. Elliptical is kind of a nice bridge the gap between bike and running. So we try to get back to running first by uh, tolerating a little bit of elliptical. And the other piece is that we can start to introduce a little bit of intensity now. And I usually start this off on the bike because the bike has been shown to be well tolerated at this point. So I'll start writing in workouts throughout the course of the week where we're doing three minutes of hard work followed by three minutes of easy work and repeating that in kind of an interval format. Okay. So we may have three days of conditioning per week. First day is kind of a longer, slower day. Second day has more intervals. Third day maybe has a faster interval. Okay. Really depends on the sport. Like I said, we didn't push conditioning too much with this patient just because they're a baseball player and their other more important qualities. So I want to try to push, right? So I don't overdo it by throwing even more conditioning at this individual. Okay. Now, how about running? Um, really, really depends on the protocol. Um, in the first study I mentioned, they were having their athletes start to return back to running by around three months. Okay. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to introduce impact with low level running drills, skipping drills, pogo jumps, that type of thing, we can start to count the total amount of contacts, right? And compare that to how many contacts you get in, let's say a 10 minute run. And if you want your individual to be able to handle 10 minutes of running, and that's, let's say 20,000 contacts, you have to build up to the point where you can handle 20,000 contacts within your rehabilitation. Okay. <clears throat> But again, this is a competing stress with what we're trying to uh, throw at our pitching athlete. So I didn't push it at this point, right? Plus, he's only at week 10 at this point, too. So uh, starting to throw a bunch of impact is probably a little bit early for him. So here is the program written out. Day one, we have trap bar deadlifting, three sets of 10. As you can see, every few weeks, we raise the RPE or the rating of perceived exertion. Um, most folks have no idea what the run one rep max is right after surgery because you're way weaker. You haven't lifted in a while. So telling someone to lift a percentage of their max doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? The way I navigate that is by prescribing rate of perceived exertion. So the first two weeks of training, the deadlift, excuse me, the trap bar deadlift, I have the athlete work an RPE of seven out of 10, right? So when you finish your set of 10 repetitions, it should feel about a seven out of 10 challenge. Okay, so you should have, let's say, three or four reps in the tank by the end of that set. Okay, a couple weeks later, we work in an eight out of 10 RPE. A couple weeks later, after that, a nine out of 10. Maybe eventually you do some 10 out of 10 and max out. But what we do is we slowly increase the intensity over the course of time using these RPEs. Second exercise was a Copenhagen plank. We're increasing the size of the lever. And then we do some backward sled drags. We have some crossover step ups. So we're introducing a little bit of frontal plane challenge. You see some super clamshells. So a more challenging hip abduction, external rotation exercise. Our athlete is getting back to throwing baseballs at a, a very high level. And that requires a ton of hip abduction, external rotation. So the clamshell is a good exercise for them. We're doing single legged squats to a box without the kickstand now. We're incorporating some anti-rotation press. If you think about a thrower, we have to train rotation for those folks, but rotation is often the thing that hurt them in the first place. So first we work into rotation by first gaining some competency in anti-rotation. And after they've gained some competence there, we work into actual rotation. Okay. Lastly, we have recline hip flexion now with a little extra load and a lateral deadlift.
on our day two, we're front squatting again, using RPE of seven out of 10 and working up to a nine out of 10 over the next few weeks. We're doing some dead bugs with a band now and some ankle weights. So making things more challenging. We have a forward sled push, single leg balances with reaches with a water ball. We have a lateral heel top with here, excuse me, heel tap with a counterbalance. We're doing some more calf raises. We're doing a dumbbell kickstand RDL, which is a great way to load up the hip and hamstring, right? And taking the balance component out by adding the kickstand. And a sissy squat with a turn on the extension. Again, make sure you don't forget about the rest of the leg, right? The quads are important. We got to make sure we continue training those. Next, we'll talk a bit about long term planning. And to be honest, I'm thinking this from the very beginning, all right? But I want to explain my rationale throughout, okay, especially if the athlete wants to know this. And this is very, very important before I end up stop working with this athlete, right, before they get discharged. Uh, now, normally, I'd be able to work with a lot of folks throughout the course of the rehabilitation. It's just that that's not always reasonable, right? A lot of these athletes will come home uh, for the summer. And they leave again to whatever university they're going to be uh, going to school at and playing their sport. So what ends up happening is that you only have short stints with them and you don't see them throughout the entirety of their experience. All right. Um, and here's the thing. Hopefully they have good support once they get back to school. Right. For this individual, he's returning back to school around 12 weeks after the surgical repair. I have done all of his, excuse me, of his rehab up to this point. Okay. And I had a conversation with him to try to figure out when he has to be able to throw based on her, his circumstances at school, right? So it's kind of lucky for him. He's, he's a good performer, right? The coach knows that he's a, a good athlete. And the coach actually has his hands full with a bunch of other athletes that he has to really prepare for the next upcoming season. Uh, so this patient doesn't have to ramp up too soon to show off or anything. So his coach knows he can throw well, right? Coach already knows that coach is just concerned, wants to make sure that there's a, a period of time where he'll be ready. Okay. Which we can decide. Right. And then the patient has to figure out if they have enough ramp up time to get to where they need to be. Okay. So we came up with a plan together and he wants to be able to throw by January 1st, which is in my opinion, plenty of ramp up time. Okay. So talking to the physician, the physician was actually okay with him starting to throw around three months, right? But really, there's no rush to do that, all right? So this goes back to our conversation of when we return back to sport, um, and it's going to be a little bit different from person to person. So this, this patient doesn't need to get back to throwing by, let's say, six months on the dot, okay? They have a little bit more time, a little bit more runway. So what we do in a rehabilitation is we actually try to prepare them a little bit better before we start to throw. So if we go a little more slowly with the progressions, we're probably less likely to get hurt over the course of time. And the other piece to think about is that this individual has had a history of some shoulder and elbow issues, which is very common with pitchers. So if we can be even slower about our rehab process, we're probably less likely to get A, hip issues, but also B, shoulder and elbow issues, which have been an issue in the past. And it's also a threat to him being able to perform at a high level. Okay. So one of the things that we're thinking about already is that, okay, once we start throwing, we need to make sure you're prepared for throwing, right? And that's going to take a lot of lower body strength and hip strength, but also the arm, right? So the upper body needs to be prepared too. So in our planning process, I want him to start his basic arm care strengthening program four weeks before he starts throwing. He's already been doing his strength and conditioning for his upper body. I have not been handling that. He has been doing that himself, but we want to be really specific to throwing so we don't get hurt either at the hip or the shoulder and elbow moving forward. Okay. And lastly, he needs to be able to make a transition from his current strength and conditioning program with me to the strength and conditioning program with the school. All right. And a lot of that is going to rely on the trainers, right? And strength coaches at school. Um, my advice was, here's what I want you to do for the next three weeks, right? Once you get to school, talk to the trainers, see if they have a good plan. Talk to the coaches, see if they have a good plan. If they don't have a good plan, you can always call me and we'll help you with the planning process moving forward. Okay. So we haven't gotten to this point yet, but I wanted to give you a little snapshot of my plan for his future in preparation for throwing. Right. So he's at week 11 right now. And at week 10, we introduce anti-rotation because we're thinking about rotating. Rotating is very important when we throw, we have to be able to drive off that backside leg and rotate. And that lead leg has to be able to control the motion of throwing. Right. So it has to be able to control internal rotation. So we need to make sure we get prepared for that. And anti-rotation is a very non-offensive way to get the ball rolling, right? 
after he's done about two weeks of that, around week 12, we start doing some cable rotation. So we're actually mimicking the same motions that the hip has to be able to tolerate. Around week 14, two weeks later, we're now getting some power involved with a square stance medicine ball throw side to side. Um, I like this drill because we're starting to introduce rotation and power, but we're not doing it with a huge range of motion. At the same week, I'm going to start this athlete with their arm care program. All right. So they start their basic rotator cuff work that's going to prepare them from throwing. Okay. Week 16, two weeks later, we move on to scoop tosses or punch passes. Basically, it's a, it's a big wind up with a medicine ball and you rotate and throw into the ball. There's a lot of power. It's very, very specific towards throwing. It's a great drill, but it's also a very high level drill with quite a bit of stress on the hip. Um, but if you can tolerate that well, you probably can tolerate throwing well. So two weeks of doing the scoop toss, we start throwing two weeks after the scoop toss, and then we start a return to throw program that pretty much ramps up, begins at the start of September, and gets our athlete ready to throw bullpens by January 1st, right? So you can see, I, we haven't gone through this process yet. You know, best laid plans sometimes, you know, go awry. So once he goes through this, if he starts having pain or problems, we'd always kind of step back, reevaluate, tweak things, change things, right? But my main communication with him was said, hey, when you get to your trainer at school, try to come up with a plan. If the plan stinks and you need help, come back to me. All right. And I'll give you guidance as needed. So I want to make sure that I'm not just throwing him to the wolves. And when he gets back to school, he has no guidance and just gets hurt again. All right. That being said, if they have a really good athletic trainer, strength coach, staff, coaching staff, and they're adept at handling these situations, then fine. I'll let them go with it. All right. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, I'm trying to protect my patient. I want to make sure that they have some good guidance moving forward. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. I have an evidence-based guide to femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, and I've made a cheat sheet from all the key points from it, okay? We go over all the relevant anatomy with FAI. We go over common mechanisms of injury. We go over radiographic findings. So basically, what does the x-ray say? What does the MRI say when you have FAI and labral pathology? How do you diagnose FAI? What are the best treatments for FAI? What is the prognosis, both with physical therapy, nothing, and also after surgery? Do you do well after surgery? What are the outcomes, right? And lastly, if you compare surgery with physical therapy, which performs better? So I've taken all of these. I've answered all these questions. I've put it in a nice, easy-to-read format, easy-to-digest, nice infographic. I'm going to leave that link in the show notes. Definitely check it out, all right? If you want to get that next level with your learning about the hips, this is the next step. Here are my references. I'll leave all the references in the show notes. If you want to check out that evidence-based um, protocol for hip labral repair, that's reference number one, DOMB et al. And if you guys want to see the protocol that I tend to use quite a bit uh, from a local surgeon by the name of Thomas Wirtz, I left that as uh, reference number four. You can check that out because that's, that's generally the one that I end up following. But again, I think it's super important that you, A, Talk to the surgeon, figure out what the protocol is. And if you have any questions about how to progress, if you think it's too fast, too slow, you take that up with the surgeon. You don't just make whatever decision you want to. I think that's a bad idea. All right. And lastly, thank you. Thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you weren't watching this right now, I wouldn't be able to do this. All right. I wouldn't be able to make money off of it. I wouldn't be able to share. Right. I, um, I really appreciate it so much. You know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Okay. If you're watching this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts. How do you do your rehabilitation with FAI patients? Do I do something differently? Do you disagree? Agree? Let me know. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, please consider doing that. If you're watching this via podcast, please consider giving me a positive rating and review. Helps out a ton. If you want to go that extra step, either with learning, right, or support, uh, supporting me, Consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. I'll leave a link in the show notes, but if you want to check it out, go to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders online library. It's just a dollar to get started and $12.99 a month after that. Thank you very much, guys.